Hello, everybody. Welcome to the IRC Podcast. This is Kevin Mullaney, your host. And today's guest is somebody who I've been wanting to interview for a very long time. He is the artistic director of the Annoyance Theater, and he is a longtime director of shows over at Second City. He's responsible for many of the most groundbreaking shows at Second City over the last 20 years. He's also responsible for some of the funnest shows uh, ever done in Chicago at the Annoyance. So let's get to our interview with Mick Napier of the Annoyance Theater. Hello, hello. For a long time, you were teaching just sort of last level at the Annoyance. Are you currently teaching right now? Yeah, I do. I teach a six-week class on Saturdays from noon to two, which I've done for 20-so years. And when I'm not in some extended project, I usually get back into the groove with that. I've been doing that. It's all scenic improvisation, and sometimes I go a seventh week. Do you have, like, specific goals of what you want to work on with them, or is it more driven by what they come into class with? Well, the first day, what I like to do is let them improvise for a while and then uh, provide them each individual kind of assessments of what I'm seeing in their improvisation, whether it be patterns that are holding them up or things that I think could challenge them more or get more funny out of their improvisation, and then just speak to each of them, take a break, and then have them improvise again based on that. And it becomes kind of a running theme what – each person's individual assessment is throughout the class. And I can usually wrangle that and remember it fairly well. So what would be like an example of something that you often see in an improviser that you would want to help them with? I might say to one person, like, in 90% of your scenes, you're leading with your head, and that's causing you to also lead with your with your uh, hands in front of you, which has all of your characters either look like they're convincing or pleading, or they look very intellectual. So I might have them tap into a different body part in order to access a different emotion or intellectual association so that their improvisation might change, their characters might loosen up a little bit. Is it often something where you're trying to sort of figure out what their trends are and encouraging them to do other kinds of things? Yeah, I've become fairly good and can pretty quickly analyze someone's improvisation and get a hold on it. So while I'm watching improvisation, all I'm doing is listening for patterns or listening for uh, or, or watching um, the way people are behaving, I'm kind of just going through a whole flow chart, a uh, whole like spreadsheet of different variables. Some people are more difficult than others, but I'll latch onto something and then I'll notice it as a pattern and then it'll go away because maybe their improvisation becomes more comfortable. So I'll just start kind of scanning and finding something else. Sometimes uh, it just might be that an improviser is really good and I want to give them a greater challenge by um, having them explore more specificity or something like that. But I always try to find something unique to that person. Even though some improvisational patterns are always the same, I strive to look for something unique in that person. There's a lot of things that you see over and over again. Like people, uh, a big one for me is is like people reference time all the time in improvisation, and it it kind of gets in in their way in the first two or three beats of their scene. And uh, if I can identify that, then I might have them make a game of not referencing time. And most people, there's, or not most people, but with some things in improvisation, people don't know they do them. I might say, like, Jim, you don't know it, but you're saying the word I mean between each sentences and between each sentence. I mean you're saying it all the time. I mean you don't even know you're doing it. I mean you're just slipping it in there. I mean it gives you permission to keep talking. I mean people do it and they don't even know they're doing it. So if people know that, then they can just kind of, kind of let a little buzzer go off in their head and just slowly get rid of that behavior. Let's take something like a, a physicality that you're noticing in someone that you want to encourage them to try something else on. How, how would you go about asking them to try on a different physicality? Well, I have to tell you, you know, the, the, the thing I'm going to say is the closest I get to, to, to anything that I, appears actory to me because I'm always on the lookout when I teach to not not create the pretension that I feel like learning acting brought to me and just how yeah, pretentious it was. So I'm always on the lookout for that. But I do do this because it does help me. And that's just to access a different body part that you lead with into the scene. So if someone like me, which is just true, leads with their head all the time, then I'll like tap into my, you know, like right shoulder or something or my chest or just let my body lead with that. And I'll have a different feeling and a different emotion attached to that. And then I let my voice follow. And that does sound actory, but it's also extremely clinical and pragmatic for me. I do it all the time because I get locked in my own patterns as well. Now, you started out studying more conventional theater I, I, in uh, college? Or? Yeah, I went to school to be a veterinarian, and then I also uh, did theater, and the theater overtook me. And uh, I started studying improvisation in college as well. The kind of training I had was probably more like method, I guess, a little bit. 
um, super objective beats, etc. Um, and I, I kind of equate that now with just point of view and improvisation, what the scene's about, what you're about, what your deal is, or what your thing is. I, f I find different ways of putting it. I've always been very careful, like even in the writing of my book, to not provide a left brain label on things because I've always wanted improvisation while we're searching to find out why it works and satisfy our left brain and analyze it and try to wrangle it with our intellect. Unfortunately, it's the opposite of that, which makes for good improvisation. In my opinion, it's the play that is the immeasurable and the non label. So even when I write about it, I, I try to leave it a little subjective. That's why I will talk about like a point of view or your deal or the thing you've got going on because I want to leave that open a little bit. So we were talking about um, theater and labeling things. Is there anything that you remember learning when you were particularly like studying more conventional theater that at the time you really disliked but over the years you've sort of come back around and realized, oh, maybe that was useful and I can use it in a different way? Yeah, definitely. I mean, the thing that comes to mind when you ask that question is uh, I used to fight. Like when I first started directing in Chicago and creating at The Annoyance, I really fought um, worrying about the end product. I was way into the process, way into the middle, way into the creating of things. I didn't care about finishing it up, making it beautiful. And almost the exact opposite now has occurred to me is that the creation process, especially in sketch comedy, is what it is. But the part that I really enjoy is putting a, putting the final polishes on it, creating it as a final product and a, like a beautiful product, et cetera. That's also very funny. So that's kind of switched for me, I think. And this that's a good transition. I, I wanted to ask you about, because you have directed a number of uh, shows for Second City. You've also directed many shows for The Annoyance. Yeah. And I would imagine it's a different process if you're putting together like a play or a musical for here or a sketch sketch comedy show for the annoyance here versus second city. Yeah, it is. It's a, it's a different process. Um, it's a different level of experience and professionalism among the actors as well. A uh, different level of pay, et cetera. So the second city experience is, is certainly more professional and the annoyance experience is a little more rough and ragged. You know, you can expect two people to not be at a rehearsal at any given time because they're doing whatever the fuck they're doing. Um, so yeah, it's a little different in that way. The annoyance does provide more freedom in its content, so it can be subversive, it can be a little dirtier, it can be a little more you know, intense or weirder or sick in a weird way. Um, so Second City is a, is a little more limited with the, that's the scope of the material you can get away with because it's a more broad audience, of course. But yeah, creating a musical is a whole different thing uh, than creating a sketch because it's it's really hard to keep the story straight like when you're improvising and trying to get it to a full narrative a full narrative arc of a musical or a play it's a difficult task to keep the funny and to not have too much exposition but provide enough that the audience can follow the storyline etc not that the annoyance storylines are so amazingly you know <laughs> intense or anything like that but it's still tough to keep that ball in the air sometimes how do you, where do you start from with a, if you were going to put together a new musical, let's say, and you were going to use improv as the, you know, as the way you generate most of the material? I think I've done it in many, many different ways. I've beaded out the entire thing and then had people improvise the beats in order to get to those plot points along the way. But the show that ran here the longest, Co ed Prison Sluts, which ran for 11 years, I was teaching a class at Second City. And I wrote down the words co-ed prison sluts on a piece of paper because I just thought of them. And then I just turned to my students and said, do you think this is a funny title for a musical? And they all said yes for whatever reason. And I only had one thing in mind for that show, and that is that I wanted to have a circus clown fight a person in drag, a drag queen, which happened, which was fun. Then other shows, like Ben Zook created a show called Tippy Portrait of a Virgin, which was just one of the best shows we ever did. And he created the story of that and had people improvise it. And you have, you have people write lyrics and music to fulfill the needs and beats of the, of the musical, et cetera. So I think there's different ways to approach it. I've also just had people improvise out of thin air the first day and create the idea from that. Now, recently you uh, directed a show called Trigger Happy. I did, yeah. I'm real proud of that one. Could you talk about it, like describe what's the idea behind it and how you... Yeah, this actually started 
Jennifer and I, my girlfriend, partner, fiance, she uh, and I do mentalism. So there's a certain construct of mentalism that kind of a, a became exciting for us, or exciting for me in, in improvisation. So the idea, actually, the first time I ever started it was at the Kansas City Improv Festival. And Dale Close and I were directing, and I just toyed with this thing because we had about five or six hours to put up a form. And essentially what it is is that um, while you're improvising, you provide certain physical or verbal cues to the rest of the cast, and that creates some sort of simultaneous event, simultaneous choreographed event. So you're, with Trigger Happy, um, what you're doing is like you're watching it, and all of a sudden um, everyone in the cast in the back line travels downstage right, and they start repeating certain words to the two people improvising stage left. Or you're watching, and all of a sudden, for no reason, everyone in the cast, including the people in, in the scene, fall down to the floor. So it just creates the idea of um, how did that magically happen. And the cast, uh, I've tried this throughout the years in many different, many different ways. I've had mixed success because some people will do it because it's an improv ex opportunity, but they didn't know what they were getting into, because, and they don't enjoy the experience because it does take a real intellectual side of you, a left brain, to catch all these moves. And it's hard to improvise that way for some people. So I auditioned for this and created an audition where you'd have to do that. And where the, and where the audition is new, that that's what they were getting into. And I got a really great cast. They're wonderful. And even after it opened, they suggested we continue working on it, which we have. Is there something that you use in your uh, classes that you know that you've borrowed from somewhere else? Absolutely. I know I was greatly affected by Martin DeMott's teaching. Hopefully his kindness and his affirmation. I don't believe in being ever mean as a teacher. I hope I never am. Uh, anytime I have been accidentally, I've felt horrible. So I, I think that in a lot of ways I captured his spirit of uh, inviting people to learn on their own and discover on their own and creating kindness and affirmation along the way as best I can. I like to fuck around in class and joke with people and fuck with people, but I never think that you have to hurt someone to do that. I have had a lot of people come up to me, and not only because I look like J.T. Simmons, is that his name, and ask me how I liked Whiplash, and I saw it, and I'm like, well, I, I don't like it because it glorifies and romanticizes that kind of teaching, which I, I find abhorrible. It's actually the opposite of what I think is needed in a classroom to inspire a student to achieve greatness. So I think I learned a lot from him. If you um, were going to teach a six-week class, and maybe this is how you approach it because you really are doing a lot of scene work, it sounds like, in your classes. But if you were going to do a six- or eight-week class and you only had one exercise, that you could only, you're only going to do one exercise or variations of it, what would that exercise be? That is the best question in the world. Let me think about it. One that comes to mind is, nah, jeez, what would I do? I think if I, I think if I could only do one thing... It would be constantly reassessing people's individual improvisation all the time and, and trying to push them to get to greater heights. And I've often wondered whether or not I ought to just make my six-week class that every single week. But I have different things I like to bring to it. The other thing that comes to mind is exploring a whole lot of improvising crazy, just improvising so you don't have the burden of having to make sense, just to stretch that part of you. But, boy, I think six weeks of that would be absolutely insane. It would make you actually crazy. And I don't know, you know, I don't think, I, if I could do like five weeks of that and then bring it back to reality for one week, it would be an interesting experiment. But I, I always love exploring the idea of what appears to be insane or crazy in improvisation because that's the part that's the most fun. And I, th I think I catch myself saying lately in classes that we spend 90% of our time in improvisation often on the most boring part, and that is trying to make sense of it or having the scene make sense, and that no one ever comes up to you and go, wow, that was fucking great. It was so funny because it really made sense. I think that there's an, I think that people describe improvisation when it's good as just like fucking crazy. What the hell happened? What the fuck were you doing up there? And I think that that's the part that I like to explore and like to stretch in people. Do you have any specific exercises that you use to try and get people to let go of the sense of the scene yeah absolutely i mean i, I do scenes where i pre prevent people from making sense which is um it only has two rules you can't speak in gibberish I, you have to speak in english and it can't make sense if you if it's making sense you're fucking up you do that for fucking you do it for like two minutes 
and it's crazy. And you find that you actually have to work hard to continue to not make sense. And that making sense is really easy. It's the just constantly not making sense where you have to stop yourself from finding patterns all the time that I love to explore. Because I think finding patterns in improvisation is a lot easier than consciously not finding them. It's easier for us to latch onto something and make sense of it than it is for us to not make sense of it. But we think it's so hard to keep our point of view or to keep our thing or to keep the game of the scene going or whatever the fuck um, that we spend so much time like worrying about that and trying to do that. Now, I remember when I read your book, there were uh, a number of things you suggested that you could do by yourself. Yeah, I only remember a few of them, but yeah. Uh, well, I wasn't going to ask you about anything specific because I don't have any in my head either. But I wondered if you, if there were some, you know, somebody's out there listening to this and they don't, you know, they want to they find a way to work on their skills by themselves. What, what would be some things you, that come to mind? I really have been, you know, caught myself turning the sound down on a movie and improvising the characters and, you know, hopefully making absolutely sure no one's going to come and interrupt that because it's really weird to come walk into a room and see someone do that. I used to do that because I was unsure just about character work, so I do it to just explore characters, and it's fun. Something I do on the walk, on the, before every performance, if I can, is walk around the block and either just, I know this sounds weird, but just name objects out loud that I see in the world or create non sequiturs out loud. And I know I look crazy and I don't care. The reason I do that is that I want to get my mind out of common associations, like for me, bars, offices, um, classrooms, stuff that's a very common and boring locations or associations, and bring, it, bring my mind to other associations out there. It'll just kind of bronze it out when I start a scene. That kind of reminds me of what TJ and Dave do in their, at least in the documentary version of their show, where they spend the day, part of the day, outside observing people, engaging with people out, you know, making sure to, to do that as part of the process for the show at night. I think that's a real healthy thing to do, especially in a city where you can observe so many different kinds of people. And I just, I, I don't even know if you know this, but I also have a book on long form coming out this fall. Oh, great. Yeah. I, over the last two years, I wrote a book on long form. I don't know the name of it yet. I think it, I want it to be improvise, you know, something improvising long form. Cause I want to keep that improvise brand going on for myself. Um, but that was born out of my desire to essentially make long form more accessible to commercial audiences and to just uh, provide performers with more tools to make it fun, just observations after seeing it for so many years. So what do you think people miss? There's an awful lot of long form done at, all over the place now in Chicago yeah. and elsewhere. And some of it's very good, some of it not, but uh, some of it really connects with an audience. Some only connects with other improvisers. Yeah. What is it that you would like to see more of in long-form improv? Well, you know, there's the kind of inside improviser's joke that long-form is a lot more fun to do than it is to see. And I think that's true a bit. But I wonder whether or not we are truly inviting, um, you know, ordinary citizens to enjoy the long-form as much as they can. Here in Chicago for the last 25 years, I feel like long-form improvisation is sometimes very insular and almost elitist to the improv community. And I call it like cool move improv, where you have a long form going on, you have a bunch of people in a room nudging each other and saying, that was a cool move, and clapping at all the cool moves, et cetera, while you have four audience members, two couples in the back who are looking at each other and thinking and saying, what the fuck is going on here? And I've talked to a lot of people who've just watched long form, and they walk out and they have no idea what the fuck they just saw. And I remember my first long-form experience seeing a Herald, because I always remember first things, and I write about this, is I remember thinking, and this is coming from college where I'd done a lot of games and a lot of sketch comedy in college, and I saw my first Herald, and I remember thinking, why are these people on stage with these performers? That's weird. Because I had never seen a back line before. So I actually remember thinking the thought, it's so odd that these performers are on stage while these the scene's going on. Why aren't they off stage? And I remember thinking, why did they just break into this group thing? I don't understand. So I watched my first Herald, and I was confused. I had no idea what I saw, and I never forgot that confusion. So in this book, I have a, an entire chapter devoted to introducing long-form improvisation 
because I don't feel as if we sometimes give our audiences the respect of, of inviting them into the experience and educating them to the experience they're going to see. So I think that in part it's to just create more power for an improviser, but also create more power for the community to embrace long-form improvisation and make it more accessible to people at large, if that makes sense. Trigger Happy has three elements in it that are somewhat like confusing for a layperson. I have in that introduction built in, and this sounds so pedantic, I'm sure, but I have built in a definition or a description of what improvisation is, what long-form improvisation is, and then how this is a differing, what, what makes this a specific kind of long-form improvisation. Because I really want the audiences to understand what they're going to see. And then I also have cards made up that if someone's late, we give them a card that explains the experience they're going to see. It's really important to me that the audience understands the context of what they're watching. You know, with, with the theater we just opened, you know, we have basically zero students. You know, right now we have like right. 15 students in one, in one class. And so, th- which That's is great, fine. Though. That's fine. Yeah. That, but it, what it means is I, I'm used to these experiences working at I.O. and then at UCB where yeah. you have hundreds and hundreds, sometimes thousands of students uh, who are interested in coming to see shows. And so even all you got to do is put up a few teachers in the show and you get at least some audience. Absolutely. Uh, but that's not happening for us. So the, <laughs> so it means uh, we have shows that are getting audience, but when they do, it's completely people just who... Citizens, right? Yeah, they're just, they just are wanting to go see some comedy. And it's really interesting to see them, how they interact with different shows. And when they get it, when they really understand what's happening, how much more they enjoy it, and and when you have them in mind rather than just like this is some cool thing we want to try. Absolutely, and I think for I think for a room you know like I O or U C B, if if you have a, a lot of students, then fine. I don't think that you have to be so elaborate with your introduction. But I think my only suggestion is know what know your room because every time you have four couples walk in there that have never seen this before. And you, I, you see like, and you can usually tell, like, these are just people off the street. It's an opportunity to educate them and allow them back to your theater as opposed to having them go through an entire experience, alienating them, having them shrug their shoulders and never come and see long form again. I hope you're enjoying this interview with Mick Napier. If you are a longtime listener, you may have thought, how can I support the IRC podcast? Well, now you can through a website called Patreon. Patreon is a crowdfunding application that helps artists publish content. But unlike Kickstarter or Indiegogo, there's not one big push to contribute. Instead, you decide how much you want to contribute for each episode. Maybe you think each episode of the IRC podcast is worth a dollar, or maybe five dollars. You pledge whatever amount you think is right. And then, each time I publish an episode, you automatically contribute that amount. And you can set a limit. So if I start publishing many episodes a month, you can set the maximum amount that you want to contribute each month. We've already got some supporters this month, and I'd like to take a moment to thank them. So please help me thank Christian Houdin, Rodrigo M.M., Daniel Anderson, Zach Parker, who is contributing on behalf of the improv program at Theater Cedar Rapids, Bearded Men Improv on behalf of Bearded Men Improv, and Bob Mann on behalf of OKC Improv in Oklahoma. If you'd like to support the IRC, please go now to patreon.com slash Mulaney. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Mulaney with two L's. And now back to the interview. Um, is there something you know that you've borrowed from, well, I mean, you talk about mentalism, but if there are areas of, I don't know, art or literature or just something you've watched on the street that has nothing to do uh, with improv directly that you know you've pulled in that you enjoy and they've hmm. woven that into your into your shows or your teaching yeah I think early on I mean I certainly the first show that we ever did the annoyance was splatter theater and I was way into those kind of movies and still am into like horror movies and torture movies and all that stuff um, a lot of this Movies make me laugh. I don't watch comedy ever, partly because I feel like that's, I work in comedy all the time. But another part of me is the exact opposite of what you just said, is I never wanted to have that influence. I wanted it to be 
kind of special and, and original. And I'm very, very impressionable. So if I do see something, I, I become very impressionable. Um, I do think that John Waters affected me a lot when I was a kid. I loved his movies, and I think that kind of weirdness. I always enjoyed reading about theater cruelty, Antoine Anto, Tristan Zara's Dadaism. So all of those things were really interesting to me. In high school, I was writing journals of Dada. I don't know why I'm just so much into that. And, you know, that harkens back to the conversation about teaching crazy stuff. But, yeah, I think that those kind of things have influenced me. Um, music always influences me, but just, I think, just in a way of feeling a certain way in life, you know, right now, which I know affects what you're doing. But I really like exploring new music all the time. Now, in your book, you spend some time talking about the rules. You know, I tend to work with more intermediate or advanced students, so they've already gone through a program somewhere else. Yep. And I imagine, well, you, you have a, a mix of students here. So I would imagine a fair number of people have just gone through the classes here, and then a yep. fair number of people have already gone through Second City or I.O. or somewhere else. Yes. Is there one thing that you wish they would stop learning before, <laughs> or some habit that they've picked up from from their earlier classes that you think are getting in their way? If they just take classes here or do this program? No, no. I mean, it just any student, like there's there's things that I notice that when a student comes to me, sometimes their, their training is showing in a way that's mm-hmm. like, this is clearly something that they were taught to do in their first few classes and they can't shake it and yeah. it, gets in, it gets in their way all the time. A couple of things come to mind. One is screaming. Screaming. If a Improviser screams, I usually just, in my mind, am only waiting for them to stop. I don't know what they're saying. I don't care. I just kind of like shut down. In an audition, I can definitely say and think, I think I can speak for everyone at Second City that watches auditions. In an audition, just don't scream because so many people do it out of nervous energy. And you can imagine hearing so many people scream, hundreds and hundreds. So everyone just kind of either physically or metaphorically put their heads down and waits for the screaming to stop. But then more in line with what you're talking about is I'm not a huge fan, and as I talk about and improvise, of exposition. I think that exposition is relevant and necessary sometimes, but I think thinking about it too much fucks you up. So when improvisers are laying in their who, what, where in the first lines of a of a scene, quite often they're doing that in lieu of creating a fun character or making another fun choice. I think improvisation works best when you make this character a point of view choice first, and then you layer in your exposition with a little more slyness as opposed to lay it all out there in the first two or three beats. I've seen so many improvisers do that, and I try to shake that up and have them not worry about that as much. Let's go back to the audition thing, because you... You've been helping, are you still help with the tour co-auditions? I do, I run them. They're called the generals now because they cast for so many different things. But yeah, I think I'm among, you know, the top 10 people in the world have seen more Second City auditions than anyone on the planet. So I've certainly seen a lot. I'm reissuing Improvise along with this other book on long form. And I added three new chapters. And one chapter is about auditioning for improvisation. And it's just observations of what people do over the years and stuff. So what would be your your biggest advice or your most common advice to people for auditions? It sounds, you know, kind of like a broken record, but it would be to start in the middle with a very specific choice because you don't want to start with a lot of exposition and a lot of unfamiliarity with your character, but just lights up, start in the middle of a sentence. When you're watching auditions, people get very nervous. When people get nervous, improvisers will resort to the same thing. They'll refer to time a lot. One day I just started making hash marks for a game for myself of how many times we heard this is the best blank ever, and that was 63 times we heard that. The best kite ever, the best factory ever, this is the best cake ever, this is the best blank ever. And that just is stuff that happens as a consequence of people being nervous and stuff. So if you start in the middle of a sentence, and then I saw Cynthia with the mailman, you're going to bypass a lot of that stuff, a lot of those traps. You're going to bypass stuff like, welcome to the, or thank you for coming to the bakery. All of those expository traps that sometimes you can't get out of. Because if you lay a piece of exposition out there and then another piece of exposition, and you, you're getting the 
there's a power loss because you haven't created a strong point of view or character, then what you feel is no heat from the audience, and then you start getting measured and start getting in your head, I think. And I think you can bypass some of that and increase your chances of getting a strong foothold in the scene if you start in the middle with a strong choice. Same boring shit, but I'm telling you. Is there anything in your book that you, your first book, that you would go back and change? If, if you thought of that after it left you, got out in the world, and you think, oh, I wish I would have done that a little differently? I probably would not have included the chapter on thermodynamics <laughs> as a metaphor for an improv scene, although I do think it's an apt metaphor and fun to read, and I think we don't read enough about science. But I, uh, I don't Ex- explain the thermodynamics. That uh, chapter? Yeah, yeah. Oh, What's the basic idea you're trying to get across? The basic idea is that the energy contained in a scene is equal to the energy contained in a closed system in accordance with the second law of thermodynamics, which is entropy always increases over time. Sounds interesting, doesn't it? A lot of fun. <laughs> That'll get your improv funnier right there. But yeah, I do it kind of lightheartedly and you know talk about it. It's a, It was a fun thing to do. And I actually wrote that chapter in Amsterdam, so... That kind of maybe makes a little sense, too. So one thing I remember uh, the first time I saw Screw Puppies, structurally it looked different than the improv I was used to. There was very, in a few simple ways, and, and I think it's true of other shows I've, I've seen here, other improvised shows, where, like you said, the back line, there is no real back line. Yeah. Uh, people are backstage when they're not in the scene. Um, yes. Can you describe what that, I don't know if, if there's a, it doesn't have to really be about screw puppies so much, but an aspect of that kind of improvisation that you like or what you like about approaching scenes that way. It's interesting you bring that up because in this long form book I wrote about, it's, there's a chapter, entire chapter devoted to the back line. Half of it is imagining a world where there is no back line in long form improvisation. And then the other half is what makes for a good one, not only from the, the audience's point of view, but also from the psychology of the performer's point of view. I advocate not having a back line because it brings the scene into complete focus. So you don't have a chance to watch someone measuring the work. I, if I'm watching a back line, then every time they turn their head or you know uh, shrug, I'm going to catch that. Or if they laugh, then they're informing me that their fellow performers think that's funny, therefore maybe I should too. Or if they don't react. But at any rate, you can't escape if you have a back line, whether it be in the sides or literally in the back, the idea that you're watching people watch something and you're watching people measure something. If you eliminate them from the stage, then what you're providing the audience is that experience, that scene. They don't have that extra added feeling of measurement. And I'm not even saying that that's a bad thing. I'm just saying it's a thing. So I like to look at both of it. Uh, Joe Bill brought in Screw Puppies, which has got a couple of things involved in um, you don't have actors on stage, and the lights just kind of edit, so you don't really have a form. It's just unrelated scenes. But you're alleviated the burden of having to edit, which brings us another special joy because you don't know how long the scene's going to be. So that's kind of fun, too. It, it brings a little more play into it sometimes. And sometimes these scenes are incredibly short. Sometimes they're very short. It gives the person in the lights an opportunity to create momentum um, with the show so by creating almost you know blackouts in a weird way or to speed the show up by shortening the length of the scenes. But then it also puts a burden on the person on lights because I don't know if you ever pulled for improv, pulled lights for improv, but it's, it's tricky. It's its own skill set. I wanted to circle back around to Martin because you, um, you dedicated your book to him. Yeah. And uh, he's somebody who I, I never studied with him. Oh, okay. Because I, I never took classes at Second City until, until I came back a few years ago. I took some writing classes. But besides that, I didn't. I had only studied at I.O. and Players Workshop and, and some other places. And, uh, but I'd heard a lot about Martin, obviously. Lots of people talk about him uh, as being a really influential teacher. And I wondered if you wanted to, um, if there's some story you wanted to share about him or some, some, like, your impression of him the first time you had class with him. or He was a guy that was, in a, in a way, like, brought improvisation to empower people's lives as much as he brought improvisation to them to improve their skill at improvisation. So he really believed in improvisation as a life-empowering tool and taught that way. So when he taught, people left his class not only feeling like they were a better improviser, but that they were a better person and more empowered in their lives. That said, Martin and I had many discussions and disagreements about 
some foundations of improvisation, some tenets of it. And we were very good friends. Um, went on vacations together, and we were really, really close. But we had a lot of discourse about improvisation and some tequila-ridden arguments about it as well, which was funny because I don't think I care about it, uh, improvisation that much anymore to be in a screaming fight about it. But he was great. A story about Martin that kind of uh, kind of exemplifies him is he had a friend who was his doctor, Dr. Viroff, an Indian doctor in New York. And Dr. Viroff and I became friends, and we would go out all the time. And Dr. Viroff and Martin and I were walking uh, in the East Village, and Martin starts talking to these cops, these two cops, before Dr. Viroff and I even realize it. So we walk ahead, and we're waiting, and we're waiting, and Martin, we look back, and Martin is continuing to talk to these two New York City police officers, and we're waiting and waiting, and finally we just turn around and walk toward the three of them to find out what the deal is, and as we're walking to them, we hear one of them go, so what do you think, Frankie, you think I should take these improv classes or what? (laughs) Swear to fucking God. Two cops on the street. (laughs) That's the kind of person he was. And two, yeah, you, you would go out and have dinner and you know a lot about the server's life after dinner, and they would think be thinking about taking improv classes or at least be empowered in some way, shape, or form, which was both charming and sometimes annoying. But he was a great guy and a really empowering teacher. Are you guys doing some sort of intensives this summer? We are. I think we're doing two sessions. I don't know when because I never know that stuff, but, yeah, we're doing two of them. Um, I'm really excited. Um, I have the opportunity to study with this card magician. I do cards. And um, one of the best card magicians in the entire world, his name is Bill Malone. And uh, I think Bill might come and study here and trade improv training for some magic training, some card training (laughs) this summer. Through a series of weird events, he got a hold of me. So I'm excited about that. And you're teaching, uh, you have classes in New York now, we in do. Brooklyn? We do. We have classes in New York. We have a small theater in New York uh, run by Philip Markle. And that's uh, been doing well. And while we're trying to cultivate uh, New York teachers, et cetera, we're also accommodating and, and inviting this exodus of Chicago actors that just moved there, like 10 of them. And they're really strong people. I remember how f- the early days of the UCB there, it was just insane how fast things can grow. I would think a lot of students um, that you come across are people who have taken a lot of improv and and maybe not other things. Uh, And I've found that over the years when I've gotten outside of that, my sort of comfort zone and taking classes and other things I'm interested in, I always, it it, uh, does a lot for my improv. Is there, what would you suggest people do besides if they want to become a better performer besides just taking another improv class? Oh, well, I'm a huge, huge advocate of that which you speak of. Um, I feel like that improvisation is an art form that invites you to, more than any other art form, to bring in a base of knowledge, a reference level, and life experience to the stage. And if you don't have that, then all you're bringing is what you experienced last night at the tavern. And I'm a real advocate of hobbies. I have a bunch of them. I, I have, these are all my hobbies, lock picking, weight lifting. I like to play pool. I like to do sleight of hand. I love to cook. I mean, it, it does go on and roller skate. At any rate, I, I really like that because it's just not only provided a fuller life, but also just brings a lot of different, um, just reference level to your improvisation. Because, you know, my old joke about improvisation is improvisation, always different, always the same. And part of the sameness of it is that people have the same kind of associations over and over and the same initiations. They live within this finite set of uh, possibilities. And if you really expand your life and explore different things, read a lot, et cetera, especially at a young age, it'll start creating a great deal of influence in what you're doing on stage. But I don't advocate that for that just for improvisation. It's just have a good life and not be so fucking entrenched in improvisation. All right, thanks so much uh, for being a guest. On well, the... thank you. It's been a pleasure talking to you. You've been listening to the Improv Resource Center podcast. I blog at kevinmullaney.com. You can follow me on Twitter at IRC And you can also support me at a site called Patreon. 
Uh, it's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash Mulaney. It's a little bit like a Kickstarter, but for people who create content like this. So every time that, uh, you know, if you want to uh, donate $1 to support the show for every episode, then you can go there and you can uh, pledge a dollar per episode. Maybe you want to pledge $5 per episode, and you're only charged, you only actually donate when I actually release a new uh, episode of the podcast. So check that out at Patreon. The producer of the show is... Scott Smith, and all the music you hear is by Gringo Motel. 